Hey everyone. Um, okay, I'm halfway through listening to a phone booth, the phone booth at the edge of the world. And um, it's fine. I, I feel like I'm having the same issue with this that I had with how to, excuse me, how to order the universe. Uh, which is also in this category, and that is that it's there's some sweet moments, there's some poignancy to it, um, but it's not grabbing me and really pulling me into the story. I'm feeling very on the surface of the story. Um, so we're following uh, Yayo and Takeshi, um, who have both lost people. One, Takeshi lost his wife to cancer, um, and Yayo lost her mother and her daughter in the tsunami. And so they're finding each other and they're bringing comfort to each other and they're, they're having a friendship, which seems like it could develop into more than a friendship. And that's really cool, that's really great, but ultimately, um, I'm not, I'm just not very captivated by it. I don't know why. Um, and then there's also like other stories of other people's, you know, tsunami experiences and the people who are also going to this phone booth and talking. And so the catharsis is interesting and everything, but I'm just really not pulled in. So, um, I'm, I'm listening to it and, um, but nothing about it is really you know, holding my attention and, and making me feel compelled by the story. So that's that for now. I'll check in again when I'm finished. Hi everyone. I finished um, the phone booth at the edge of the world today. And I was very glad that it improved for me in the second half of the book. Um, I really thought that there was a bit more cohesion in the second half and the characters' relationships developed more, and there was more of a general, just like great, you know, the themes kind of came together a little bit more with the story. Um, and I think the deepening of the relationship also really helped with the story. Uh, so I think it was a really successful book overall. But there were still things about it that kind of annoyed me, and I feel like it actually has a similar um, vein to it to How to Order the Universe, in that there's this really strange new trend in books. It's really not something I've noticed before, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if there's many, many books that use this method, but they use lists. And the chapters in this book are very, very short, and there's kind of like longer chapters with more content, and then kind of these little vignette chapters that are really just little asides. And I think they're meant to be charming, and they're meant to add context to the pre some the previous scenes and some of the other chapters. But a lot of the time, they took me out of the story, and they separated me from what was actually happening. And I also feel like this idea of using lists of like products to describe a character trait is, is not that effective to me. I don't really understand why someone thinks that listing, like in the case of Phone Booth at the Edge of the World, she listed a whole bunch of sweets that Yoi and the little girl Hana went and bought at the store and she listed the brand names and I thought what does that really say about the characters it says that they like chocolate it says they like sweets it might be sentimental to someone who knows what Japanese sweets are and so is picturing what those sweets are but not having any experience with that for myself um there was no nostalgia to it and there was no connection to what that might mean for the characters. The characters like chocolate and they like sweets and they eat them together. There's no need to give me a list of what those sweets are. It doesn't add anything to the story. It just distracts from the story 
and pulls me away. And I can think of a few novels in the last couple years that I've read that do that. And I just don't think lists are very effective as a tool. If it's describing, if you're trying to describe a character and use like all that the, the character packed in their suitcase was a pair of shoes and a sweater and a toothbrush or something like that. You're trying to show that this character is very minimal, that they're very simple, that they only need the basics. I understand the idea of making a list, but to take a list out of the context of the story and put it in its own little chapter and say, they went to the store and this is what they, a list of what they bought at the store. I just find that really not effective as a tool and it's being used a lot by, I don't know if it's a certain generation of writers who really identify with like a certain type of products, like they like the nostalgia of products, so they want to list them. Like I want to talk about, you know, breakfast cereals that I ate when I was a kid, so I'm going to say Fruit Loops loops and frosted flakes and cocoa puffs or something and it's going to tell everyone you know it's going to connect these people to this character and i'm like i don't think it does though so anyway that's just a little pet peeve that came up when i was reading this novel and it's something that i've noticed in a few novels recently um overall i thought it was a lovely book it did move me quite a bit at the end um, because I think the messages in it of, of finding love again, of finding healing after grief, after like the worst imaginable grief was, was really quite well done. Um, and it is a real place and it is a place of healing. And the author put in a note at the end to say, you know, don't go here as a tourist. Like this is not a place to take photos on your vacation. This is a place of healing and please respect it. Um, yeah, so I thought it was good. I, it's, it, it, it's not better than The Art of Losing. Um, so The Art of Losing is still number one for me right now. Um, and uh, now I'm going to move on to... <sighs> I think I'll move on to The Brickmakers soon. It is... Um, I put it on hold at the library. And it is coming into... Uh, into the it, it's in transit right now almost at the library so i think i will read it next but um you're not going to know this because this is going to end and then you're going to see me reading the next book but there's probably going to be several weeks in between because um i've got a couple books that i want to finish in august that are for my summer tbr and then i will read the last two books that i need to read for the book two prize so there'll be a bit of a pause you're going to see me reading those other two books in a couple weeks and i uh, will see you then Hey everybody, uh, checking in halfway through Brickmakers by Selva Almada. Uh, so I opened this uh, feeling a little bit worried because it was very violent and um, unsettling uh, at the beginning. And um, it's obviously very much a commentary on toxic masculinity. Um, and a specific culture's version of toxic masculinity, but that doesn't mean that you want to read a whole book about it. Uh, but, you know, as you as I kept reading, um, things started to shift a little bit and you started getting more backstory. Um, so we open with two men who, it sounds most likely, were in a fight, some sort of a violent altercation, either together or in a group and they are laying separately and they are both kind of, you know, coming in and out of consciousness, potentially dying. And so you know that something weird and violent has happened, but you don't really understand what and where it's come from. And so now you're getting through, through each chapter and the chapters are quite short. They're really um, quick chapters, like two, 
two and a half to three pages usually, sometimes even shorter than that. Uh, and then you kind of start getting backstory, who their parents were, um, and so that's where we are right now. We're, we're kind of in the midst of the story. Um, I don't really know any time period. There's no time period delineated other than the police officers are using a typewriter to record statements from witnesses. Um, and it, there's a little bit of a kind of um, a mystery around the murder of someone as well. So you're kind of playing that into the story. Um, and learning a lot about Argentinian culture. I mean, again, it's, it's a little hard to give it any context because you don't really get context in terms of a time period or a place or um, I would say working class uh, people. Um, working class to poor people and um, you know people who are living in various um, levels of um, subsistence around like migrant worker like moving you know working from job to job like not, not holding down anything and then you do have these two families that are working at brick making one way or the other but both of the fathers also um have like gambling things and drink a lot and live in you know in that kind of hyper masculine world of violence and um uh grabbing what they want and not being very um sensitive to their children but having grown up in very hard environments as well so yeah that's where we are um i'm very engaged with it and um i feel like a little it's a little hard to keep track of everyone because of the way the chapters move um but i'm starting to like the families are starting to fall into place and like the, the the characters are starting to fall into place um and yeah so i will check in again when i have finished it Hey everybody, so I finished Brickmakers by Salva Almada, translated by Annie McDermott, and uh, it was quite a book. I I think overall I enjoyed the exploration of working class rural living in um, Argentina, and I think that the themes were um well constructed and, and interesting um kind of toxic masculinity and the suppression of homosexuality in that culture um and um yeah you know i was intrigued by it i was um drawn along through the story um but to me, if you're comparing it to some of the other books in this in this um, category in this in this um, final round, um, it didn't give me enough to uh, surpass um, my top ones, and I wouldn't say that it's as good as. Um, some of the other books I read in the sec in the semifinal. So, you know, I I um, I'm glad I read it. I think um, uh, it's one of those books that will be difficult for some people to read because of the language and the. There's a lot of violence in here, um, and 
I think that for some people it would be difficult to go through that. I, I mean, I found the violent parts difficult and kind of the the lack of unlikable characters. Like almost all the characters are, um, you can't really connect to them emotionally because they all have um, these kind of undermining personalities. And I like that about books. I like complex characters. I like multi-layered people. So I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying that as an overall read, as something that, you know, trying to judge it in terms of how it would go over being read by lots of people, I don't think it has a mass appeal compared to The Anomaly, for instance, by Hervé Letelier, because I think it's much more niche in in its in who it's going to appeal to. So, um, so that is it for Brickmakers, and we are now on to Disquiet. I will be starting that tonight, and it is also not a very long book. So I anticipate, hopefully, getting it read within a week and a half, maybe. Um, just because I do have to start another book as well, so I can't read it exclusively. And um, and then I will be submitting my rankings. It is um, it all. It's always amazing to get to this point in the year and think this is it. This is the final round. Um, and uh, I'm very curious to see um, who's going to win out of this grouping. I mean. Having read four now out of, sorry, five out of the six, uh, yeah, I, I feel like uh, definitely um, one of the round five, or, or sorry, the semifinal round books uh, deserves to be in this last grouping. I really think it does. I I think that <laughs> I'm I'm still kind of flabbergasted as to why it didn't get through um, because you know I'm just not I'm just not getting the same scope or the same depth from these other reads that um, that I got from that one. So and it's very interesting. Anyway, I will check in again when I have gotten halfway through. Um, disquiet. Hey everyone, I just wanted to check in. I am three quarters of the way through Disquiet um, by Zulfu Lavteri. And uh, I, I just, it's such a short book that I wanted to make sure that I checked in kind of before I finished it, basically. So what's going on in Disquiet? It is set in Turkey. And it's very educational. It's very, it's an interesting mixture of matter of fact storytelling with a mystery kind of thrown in there. And um, we're following our main character who's a journalist and he has been living in Istanbul. And he's kind of moved past the kind of small village mentality, small town, small city mentality that he had when he was growing up, which it was in Mardin, which is, I believe, an area closer to the Syrian border. And this is an area that has a lot of Syrian refugees um, and a lot of different religions and languages and cultures all coming together. And so you're following him as he returns to Mardin because of one of his childhood friends has been, has died and his death was rather mysterious and was connected to a um, refugee woman who was of the Yazidi religion. And so you're learning about the relationships between Muslims, um, uh, Yazidi religion and all these other religions that are cultures that are mixed up in this area. And you're learning about kind of the refugee crisis that is happening in that area. Um, and then you're also learning about kind of customs and um, stereotypes that are happening uh, by, by cultures towards each other. 
and how, you know, there's like rules about interactions and things like that. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's what it's about. It's short chapters, um, each chapter relating to kind of a different piece of the puzzle that this, our main character is finding as he is investigating into this mystery of his friend's death and trying to find the woman that he was apparently in love with um, as well. So that's where I am right now. And I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting novel. Um, there's nothing about it though that's really connecting with me emotionally. It's, um, it's much more of a factual, it feels like a factual narrative. It's got, um, it doesn't have a lot of emotional depth to it. Um, and the chapters are told uh, by by sometimes the first the first person perspective of the journalist, but then also it, it's like the person that he's interviewing is talking to him, but his dialogue is not included. So it's just them, and then they'll sometimes be answering a question and referring to him, but there's no dialogue from him in the chapters. So that's a kind of interesting way to put the book together. And um, that's all I have to say for now. I will check in with you again when I finish it. everyone so I wanted to wrap up this quiet for you and um, I just had to rewatch my halfway or three-quarters of the way uh, video and I wanted to say that um, the second part of the book actually had a lot more emotional impact on me than the first uh, because there was some first-hand accounts of the Yazidi um, refugees who were being sex trafficked, basically. Um, and so some of those first-hand accounts were very, very harrowing, but also very emotional and offered some layers to the story that I thought were very compelling. Um, there was one part near the end that got a bit weird and that is when the journalist finally found this woman who his friend had been engaged to. He became obsessed with her and was kind of, that was very uncomfortable for me um, because I felt like, I, I think I understand why the author put it in the story. He was trying to illustrate this kind of savior mentality that comes over people when they are around someone that has gone through probably like a harrowing or or traumatic experience people can get very um like they want to help so much that they they overcompensate and they um they force their help on people and you can't do that it, like you can't force someone to take your help or to want to be helped by you. Um, so, so that was a really uncomfortable moment in the story. Um, but I understand why he said it because I think that's probably something that happens quite often to, um, people who have gone through trauma, who, um, are trying to find a way through it themselves and trying to deal with it. And then someone else will come in and impose their kind of savior, you know, complex onto this other person who, you know, does not want that. So, um, that was really interesting. Um, and, uh, overall I learned a lot reading the book and, um, you know, I, I think it was, I think it was a well put together story that, um, spoke to a very specific moment in a very specific place and time and group of people and groups of people, multiple types of groups of people. So, uh, yeah, overall it was, um, a good book and, um, I am going to end this vlog here 
If you are interested in learning about the order in which I put uh, the finals for the translated fiction of the Book 2 Prize, you can um, tune into my rankings video for that. So thank you so much for watching and I'm back in soon with another video.